We're continuing on this morning with new wineskins. God's doing a new thing. And it's God's desire that we be that remnant, that we be a people that bring glory to his name, that move in the things of the kingdom of God. And we've actually spent the last couple of weeks kind of building a a foundation, building, uh, being able to change our paradigm to where we could actually understand what God's trying to lead us toward. And I want to continue with that this week. And I want to go to uh, Colossians, or 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And the way that we're going to be studying the tabernacle, and this is moving to tabernacle within. We need to understand that when God first gave the tabernacle to Moses, it wasn't made out of stone, was it? It was covered in skin. God was trying to, to help us understand that he was wanting to dwell within and that there's a tabernacle within. You know, it's amazing in the book of Revelation where you look at the court of God, there's four and 20 elders and there's a, there's a green rainbow over the throne of God and all these different things. And you know, why is God's rainbow green? Well, why is gall in your liver and your gallbladder green? Because the very inside of your body was made to reflect the throne room of God. You have the throne, the heart. You have the four and 20 elders. You have the, the rainbow of green and the liver and the gallbladder. And I mean, you can go on. Because God was trying to, to teach us he wants to reign here. If he reigns here, everything in our lives begin to, to fall in order. And Paul is, is, is kind of telling for a time that, uh, and I, I can't remember now what 1 Corinthians was written before or after the destruction of the temple. But here he says, he says, know ye not that you are the temple of God. Church, don't you know that you are the temple of Almighty God? If we would really get that into our spirit, I think we'd act a little bit differently. We would choose things a little bit differently. If we would get in our minds, can you imagine there wasn't a lot of junk going on around the tabernacle in the wilderness, was there? Could you imagine this, some of the crazy stuff that we see in the church today? Could you imagine that being around the temple, being around the tabernacle in the wilderness? No. My thing is, why are we allowing that to be around us when we are that tabernacle? We need to understand that what we do and what we believe and as we obey the commandments of God, we are building the tabernacle within. And one of the reasons I, I chose this picture is that's the fire of God that I'm looking for. And to be truthful in my own life in the times even when God really moved greatly, it was no more than somebody flicking a big lighter and we called it church and called it revival. In the day and the hour that we are headed, we need the power of God. We need the kingdom to work. The kingdom will work when nothing else is working. Our hope is not in Washington. Our hope is not getting a man into office because the Bible says the, the arm of flesh will always fail you. How many of us even had some of our best friends fail us because it was just humanly impossible to do? But with God, all things are possible that I can walk in a kingdom that is not moved or not shackled by the things that are going on on this planet. That's the kingdom that I want to move in. He said, listen, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. How many know on the day of Pentecost it was fire that came and settled on them? Now that was upon, how many know that when you make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, the Holy Spirit comes in. He's the one who does the new birth. But when the Holy Spirit comes on, it's like the mantle of Elijah falling on Elisha. It's the mantle of Jesus coming upon us so that we can do ministry in the earth. And we have got to have that fire. And he goes on to say, if any man defile the temple of God, he shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. For the temple of God is holy. You're supposed to be holy. That's why holiness is so important in the life of the believer. One of the, 
One of the things that we see in the intertestamental period when when Titus Epiphanes came in, he sacrificed pork or a pig on the altar of God and it desecrated the altar. And yet we don't think a thing, unless you understand Leviticus 11 for today, you don't think a thing about having a pork chop or a ham sandwich. If it desecrated that temple, it desecrates this temple. That's why God said don't eat it. Why? I don't know. If God, you know, if God said don't eat it, don't eat it. Now, one of the things I have found out in my own studies is that pork or swine is holy in the occult. In all pagan religions, it's holy. You know why? It, like human flesh, can contain demonic energy. Where did the swine go after Jesus cast them out? We need to understand that God says, listen, that stuff was, can, can hold demon flesh and, there can, and uh, pagan things can come with it. Leave that off your menu. Why? I'm holy as he is holy. Jesus never sat down to eat a pork sandwich. I'm, I've decided I'm not going to anymore either. I've had to repent of my bacon. I've had to repent of my, my pork chops, my ham sandwiches. Now everybody can say, thank the Lord for turkey sausage and turkey bacon. It's good. It goes great with the eggs, but it does not defile me. Because if I am required of God to be holy, but this is what, this is what really kind of makes my eyebrow. He said, if any man defile the temple of God, God would destroy. I wonder how many believers, when they let sin in their life and, the, and that, that sin begins destroying their life, is not a fulfillment of this scripture. How many Christians do we know that laugh at the commandments of God and talk about victory they're supposed to have all the time in their lives, but their lives are falling apart? They haven't realized that they have defiled the temple of God, and it's not talking about this church building. We are the church in motion. So we continue having church and being the church after we leave this service. If we would have that mindset how much different our week would be. You see, a lot of this stuff I'm having to adjust in me too. I want to be God inside conscious. I want to be I'm a temple of God conscious so that everything around me needs to learn to succumb to the kingdom of God and the temple of God. And not only was that temple not defiled, they couldn't have defilement in the camp around the temple. Some of us have got to do some house cleaning just a little bit. We have. What I've found every once in a while, you kind of circle around, it's time to go back through the movies again to make sure there's nothing in there offensive. And I've made the mistake. You know, you watch something on TV and they edit out all the cuss words. Well, it's a good action movie. It's a good movie. And then you buy it on video and say, my word, I need to get, find that actor and just put a big old bar of soap in his mouth. And anymore, Mary and I decided you know, if there's something that we would like to watch, we may just record it off TV because they've already done all the editing for us. They, they've koshered that film, you know. And so there's, there's sometimes the Holy Spirit will move you and you have to go through and, and clean your home out and, and, and get the different things out of your life so that you don't defile the temple of God. That, that, that is very, very serious. You know, one of the things that uh, kept God's presence, how many know that they needed... When they were in the wilderness, they needed to have the protection of God around them. And God said, I'll, I'll walk through the camp. But if there is any unclean thing, I won't come. And one of them said, well, I wonder what special ritual it was. It was called a shovel. That when, when you needed to use the restroom, you went outside the camp and you used a shovel. Because God says, if you don't do it that way, I won't be in the camp. There's some common sense things that we need to do. And, and you know, if God to that point said, I won't come in if that is there. How many things do we allow in the camp that in a sense violate the word that we've never taken his commandments serious enough? You see, what I'm after, guys, how many enjoyed the presence of God here this morning? I I enjoyed it, and I want to see it increase, but also what I want to do is get you guys to where that level of the presence of God is at your home, that the peace of God, the shalom of the kingdom is at your home. And if we will understand that we are the temple of God and that we're supposed to carry the peace of the kingdom within, we can experience it at home just as much as we can here. But we got to realize that we need to be holy.
Holiness goes beyond the church doors. It needs to go in the home. It needs to go into the workplace. But I also want to look at something else. God told Moses in Exodus 25, 8, 9, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. That what God did, God showed Moses a pattern of what was in heaven. There is a divine pattern, and what we're going to discover here in a little bit, that the basic pattern of the tabernacle is literally a universal template for spiritual things. But, uh, you know, everybody always gets so caught up with the, the temple of Solomon. Yet I can look at Solomon's temple, and how many know he fudged on some things, and he hired some people that he necessarily shouldn't have hired to help build it? And there are some things that are almost occultic, in the, in the making of Solomon's temple. Huh. That's, for, that's a whole not, another study. But that's why the Masons get so excited about that temple. They never, ever talk about the temple of Moses or the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness because it is the truest, I believe, the truest reflection of the temple of God because God was saying in that, you cover it in skin. It was portable. I want to move with you. I want to be with you. I want you to encamp around about my presence always. And it changes it from going to church. Or you know, Everybody has the mindset, well, I'll be spiritual at church, but when I leave, I don't have to be. But how many know when they lived around the Ark of the Covenant, when they lived around the Mishkan of Moses? You didn't have that attitude. You lived there. You saw it day and night. They were conscious of the presence of God, guys. And we need to be conscious. We need to also understand that God wants to do more than this, just follow a pattern. And if you notice, I, kept on, I keep on showing these things of the pillar of fire. I think it's so interesting that God is giving this to me because that is, that is the level of the power of the Holy Spirit that's supposed to be in our lives. That when the devil looks at you, he needs to see fire. You know, when John saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, he had fire in his eyes. How many know that's what the eyes of the believer are supposed to look like when you see them spiritually? The devil doesn't get worried as long as the light isn't on. If there's no fire there, he doesn't worry too much. But when someone, when he's looking at someone to attack them and he sees the fire of God in their, in their eyes and the name of Jesus on their lips, he has to think about that just a little bit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, we have always heard that preached about marriage. Now, how many know that's, that's good for marriage? But that's not what it's talking about here at all. He's talking about that we're the temple of God and we should not be involved in pagan things. Oh, if the church would just get a hold of that. I have grown tired of good men going up and, and saying, these things really don't matter if we do them or not. Yeah. Mary and I uh, listened to a rabbi that we just love, and he just went on, you know, he's, he's talking about Hanukkah and different things, and, and then he was talking about the Christmas miracle. And Mary said, how in the world can a Messianic rabbi teach it's okay for Christians to do Christmas? And I sat there and I thought about that for a while, and I thought, I bet he's of the order that believe that Gentiles only have to keep the Noahide law. So the rest of it's not ours. So when God says, don't learn the way of the heathen and do it unto me because I'm the Lord, that doesn't necessarily apply to us in his theology. But how many know that it's one law for all people? And we need to make sure this. Now, let's, let's go on. He said, now, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what accord hath Christ with Baal? That's important. In fact, on our, on, our, on our blog, I posted two videos uh, from Frank, or what's his, what's his name? I, did this, I just lost me, the ones I just posted this week. Norm, Norm Franz, on the mystery of Christmas, and he, he shows biblically that it's, it's literally sitting at the table of Baal. What fellowship, there's the table of the Lord, and there's Jezebel's table. 
Which one are you setting at, believer? Which one are you setting at? I choose the table of God, and it's a kosher table. It's a table of the kingdom. It's a table of God's commandments. It's a table that honors Jesus in everything that is said and done. And don't and it does not take something that is pagan and just slaps the name of Jesus on it. You know, I can go out here and get a little. Remember when they used to make those old pintos? And, uh, I mean, when they first came out with those four cylinders, two big people get in, it wouldn't even hardly go. It's like, it like a go-kart. Do you know that you can take one of those and you can slap a Ferrari sticker on that and it does not make that Pinto a Ferrari? And we just think that we can put a bumper sticker on something or slap a sticker on something and make it different. It doesn't work that way. It goes back to its origin. Who is it really honoring? And if we try to make it God's, well, can't God redeem it? Well, define the word redeem to take back something that was yours. It was never his. It was never his. Right now, God is redeeming the feasts of the Lord, bringing them back in the eyes of the people that they would be holy. He is redeeming his commandments, making them holy in the lives of the people. And he said, what hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? He's talking about you and I. Why, why should the temple of God have anything to do with idols? You see the response of an idol? Remember when they took the Ark of the Covenant down there and the Philistines got a hold of it and set it in front of Dagon? Dagon could not stand up after that. He kept on falling down and finally his arms broke off. You see, the, the true kingdom of God... Why, why did he do that to Dagon? Because the commandment of God is to tear down the idols. And where God's throne is, the idols are tore down if God's throne is going to be there. And saints, if God's throne's going to be here, every pagan idol's got to come down. Every pagan practice has got to come down. Every self-centered agenda has got to come down for me to have him on the inside of me. And he goes on to say, For ye are the temple of the living God, as the Lord has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean. Now thing in the King James is italicized. That means it's not there. It's not a thing. He said, don't touch anything unclean. What's unclean? Everything the Torah says is unclean. It's not a singular item. It's the entire category of everything the Word of God has said is unclean. God said, don't touch it because I want to walk among you. I want to live in you. I tell you what, there's been a lot of times in my own life that Mary and I have come into situations where the devil's tried to kill us. And the reason he couldn't is when we walked up into that situation, Almighty God walked up in that situation with us. And it was his presence that spared our lives. And how many believers are cut off short because what they were doing, God loves them, but his manifested presence couldn't be with them. And they found themselves in dire straits. Let me put before you the difference between a miracle and a disaster may be keeping the unclean thing away, believer, so that God's presence can be there. And see, I'm wanting to learn how to turn up his presence. I'm wanting to learn how to hear the Holy Spirit more clearly. I'm learning how to, I'm learning, I want the gifts to flow more profoundly in my life. I want that word to be more real in my life. I want the anointing of God to flow through my hands as I'm doing his commandments in the earth as a testimony of who he is. And to do that, I've got to understand, I am required of God to build the tabernacle within. It's there. You know, it's like sanctification. Sanctification is both instantaneous and progressive. This is basic theology. The minute you get saved, you're sanctified to God, but you got a whole lot of sanctifying to do after you get saved. And as I sanctify and as I walk with God, I begin building the things of God on the inside of me. And let me tell you something. Once it's built on the inside of you, no government, no despot can ever take it away. That's why the kingdom of God flourished in New Testament times under Roman rule. They were persecuted 
but they couldn't take it away from them. All the external things, how many know this building can be taken away from us? All the things, anything that I can pick up with my hands can be taken away from us. The only thing that can't be taken away and the only thing that's going to get to heaven with you is what's on the inside of you. And we have spent so much time building things on the outside that we have never spent any time building things on the inside. Building things on the inside are going to get you through. Let's see if I can finish this thing. And this guy says, I'll receive you, verse 18, and I will be a father unto you. Looks like I need to change my slide, don't I? There we go. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith Almighty God. I want to get to where that flame's burning in my heart that way. I'm not there yet. There, there are times it feels, you know, sometimes I can feel it burning. Sometimes I'm still thinking, well, if I could just get enough kindling on there to get it going, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's never, ever be satisfied where you are spiritually. There's more. If finite man is dealing with an infinite God, then there's never enough. There's never enough. The angels that sat there and cry, holy, 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 and have since the beginning of time. And the reason they're crying, holy, 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 is about every 15 seconds they see a new aspect of God that's more glorious than the first. And they have been doing that since the day they were created. That's the God that we have to serve. And he says, listen, I want to walk with you. I sent my son to the cross for you so that I could redeem you. I could be your kinsman redeemer. Because I want to walk with you at that level. And then we get satisfied with a little dabble, do you? Uh Uh-uh. I want to find out how to get into the ocean of God and swim around just a little bit. (coughs) Excuse me. I'm going to show you how this universal pattern works out because this is so neat. There are three areas to the tabernacle, the outer court, the inner court, and the holy place. You can't have a true tabernacle without that. There's three chambers, and all of them are contained in the outer court. It's set in the middle. Now, let's see if that works with our understanding of God. The Holy Spirit is in all the earth, and what does he do? He brings you where? To the Son. The Holy Spirit is not here to testify of himself, is he? He is here to testify of Jesus. And Jesus says, no man can come unto the Father but by me. You got to start in the outer court. You got to get into the holy place to get to the holy of holies. There's no other way. People that say they walk with the Father without Jesus, you can't do it. And you can't find Jesus unless the Holy Spirit comes a calling. Aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit? I'm worried about people that always say the Holy Spirit's talking and he's always talking about himself. He will not talk about himself. Jesus said he come to testify of me. And so when the Spirit of God is dealing, he's always talking about Jesus. He's trying to bring you to the cross. He's trying to show you another aspect of Jesus that you never saw. And when you get to Jesus, he says, won't you come on in here so I can take you to the Father? I want to come in here and say, I want to introduce my new new brother, my new sister who has accepted me and has accepted my sacrifice. And now they can come in my name before your throne, Father, anytime they want to. So the pattern holds out, doesn't it? Look at the next one. Spirit, soul, and body. The reason we're a tripartite being is because we were made to be a tabernacle in the wilderness. We were made to be a tabernacle in the wilderness. So what goes on in the outer court is important. Keeping the commandments. Our soul renewing our mind to the word of God. Important. God coming in and filling our spirit man with the fire of God is important. Now, once you get in, true Christianity is lived from the holy of holies out. It's what God does on the inside of you that matters, and it adds power to what your soul does. It adds power to what your flesh does, not the other way around. You see, if you don't have Jesus... You can't do anything except out here in the outer court. That's where religion is dead. There's no power to it. They're going through the motions, but they can't have the devotion because the kingdom is not within. 
But when the Holy Spirit draws me and woos me to Jesus, and I really accept Jesus, the real Jesus. How many know Jesus didn't come from Hollywood, didn't come from Detroit? The shock some, he was not raised in the hills of Tennessee. He came from Israel. I've had people get shocked when I say Jesus was a Jew. No, he wasn't. He's was Baptist. You know, he joined John's church right before he started his ministry. A good Baptist boy. Yeah, a good Baptist boy that kept the Sabbath. But anyway, <laughs> he was a Jew that kept God's commandments perfectly, that kept the feast, that walked in all the ways of God perfectly. He was without spot nor wrinkle. He died as the king of the Jews. It was declared right over the top of his head who he was. He resurrected not only as the king of Jews, but the king of glory. And he's going to come back and rule and reign in a Jewish court that he establishes in Jerusalem. He's not going to ask Washington, D.C.'s permission. He doesn't care what Moscow thinks. He doesn't care what they think in Beijing. He's going to come and he's going to rule and reign and all of the nations of this earth are going to have to answer to him. And on that day, the sale of pork will drop out completely. <laughs> People will stop buying fog machines for church services and strobe lights and, and all these different things. All the games will stop when he comes back. But let me tell you something. He's already come here. Shouldn't the game stop here? Shouldn't they stop right here? When I was a child, I did childish things. But now that I've become a man, I've put away childish things. Guys, it's time for you to put away your Tonka toys and get on into the kingdom of God. Have you gotten happy yet? I'm already happy. <clears throat> now the distraction. In Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 17, and they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the, money ch uh, the tables of the money changers and the, and the, and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man would carry any vessel through the temple. He taught, saying unto them, Is not it written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, and ye have made it a den of thieves. Twice in Jesus' ministry, when he started his ministry, he cleansed the temple. Three and a half years later, he's right back to where it was, and he cleansed it again before he gave up his life on the cross. Because everybody got so involved in what was going on outside the gate, they couldn't get inside the gate to do what was really required of them. And let me tell you something. Today, the money changers have simply transformed what they look like. Much of church today is the church of the money changers. How much stuff is really of God? Does God need a fog machine to have church? Does God need big stoplights and spotlights to have church? Church is not supposed to look like a KISS concert. And yet we're told, well, you have, that's the only way to get in this generation. Let me tell you something. If we would do this thing right and get the presence of God here the way it's supposed to be and that we become the temples of God the way that we're supposed to, I don't think you could keep the youth out. The reason that we have lost the youth is they have gotten tired of the games of the money changers. They're looking for answers. And so we send them to university. They go in Christian, 95% of them come out agnostic. And they charge you five to $900 a credit hour to do that to your kids. You know what put an end to that mess? Quit funding it. If you don't teach my kids the word of God and how to walk with God and how to do commerce or whatever the area according to the word of God, you're not getting one penny of my money. But those guys are drawing sometimes three quarters of a million dollars a year to teach your kids that. It's time for the money changers to stop. 
A lot of what we go, got going on in the body of Christ is no more than Gnosticism. With a Christian veneer, it's got to stop. How many know the, the, the service here is not about a motivational time? It's not, it's not me getting up as a motivational speaker and giving you 10 steps to feel better about yourself. You know how you're going to feel better about yourself? When you find out Jesus loves you and then he gave himself for you and now he has cleansed you and redeemed you and made you something in the kingdom of God. If that doesn't make you feel better about yourself, then I don't know what will. It's who I am in him. Well, Mike, what do you do about the past? The apostle Paul says, I count all things as dung to just know him. The past is a dung hill I refuse to visit anymore. <coughs> Guys, we have got to move beyond the distractions. Almost everything that they're doing today that says this is the way that you build a church, it is if you're building the church of the money changers many, in many areas. Mary and I were talking about this this morning. It says, well, the, 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 you know, the, are you coming against kids' programs? No, how many know that uh, you need to like, have something to bring kids in? Bust them in as many as you can get. And while they're sitting there playing in the ball pit, teach them about Jesus. Don't just entertain them. Get their attention and then teach them and then have some fun with them because they may not get any fun. But you know what I've also found out about those kids? They probably don't get any loving at home either. They just need a mama to hug on them and, and, and give them a mother's Torah, give them a father's Torah. They'll love that more than they will the ball pit or whatever else that you might have. But guys, we've got to move beyond this. I'm done with the circus. I am done with the money changers pit. I am done with all these things. I just want the simple kingdom of God. I want the commandments of God. I want the temple of God built within me more than anything else. But you see, there's only one way in. Jesus said unto them, this is uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why is that so important? Because if you study out the temple, it had three gates. The first one called the way. The second one called the truth. And the veil that separated in the Holy of Holies was called the life. Jesus said, if you want to get to the Father, you've got to do it by me. Only through what he has done for us. Only when I come to that cross and I yield I think one of the things that needs to take hold of the Messianic movement is a good Baptist preaching for a while because they have lost sight of the cross. There are many Messianic movement, uh, uh, churches right now that seldom ever utter the name Yeshua or Jesus except in passing, and they never preach the cross. How many know that without the cross, a Jew cannot become a completed Jew? Without the cross, a Gentile has no hope of entering into the kingdom. I have got to come to that cross, and I've got to see my sins on that cross. When we look at the horror of what Jesus went through, it was not his horror. It was mine. It was my guilt, my shame, my disobedience piled up on him on the cross. And when I identify with that and surrender to that, only then... Can I go beyond the money changers and start walking in the inner court? It's only one way. One way. And we've got to ask ourselves this morning, have I really entered in by that way? You see, there are some groups out there that teach the Hebraic truths, but they never preach the cross. That to me is almost an oxymoron. How can you teach the commandments of God without teaching what the commandments were all about. It, they, the Apostle Paul said the, the commandments was a pedagogy to bring us to Messiah. Then once we get to Messiah, they become the, the, uh, the power to walk with him the way that he walked. It's how to walk in the kingdom. But not only is it the only way in, it's the only way the entire temple will function. It is not by chance that when you line up the brazen altar, the brazen laver, the table of showbread, the lampstand, uh, the altar of, censor, uh, altar of, of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant, they make a cross. 
Only in Christ can I function there. Only in what he has done. If I try to do it any other way, it will never, ever, ever, ever work. I mean, no, that, I mean even when you, when you take the way that the, the children of Israel encamped round about the tabernacle, it makes a cross. I should have gotten a picture of that too as illustrated. And then God says, the only way you can get into this thing is to, through the cross. And then the only way that will ever function is by the cross. And let me, one of the things we're going to get in into the weeks ahead, you can't start here with the Ark of the Covenant and work your way out. You better start here. Because until you do this right here and do this right here, you can't even get to the revelation of, of who God is. We have so many ministers dipping into either Kabbalah or Gnosticism to sound deep because they won't take care of business out here. I want you to think about that just really. You, I know I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm really wanting to preach on the furniture so bad. Oh, um, the brazen altar. How many know this court is big? You know why it's so big? You got a lot of junk that you need to bring into the outer court and to offer up on that brazen altar. All of us have lots and lots of junk. You see, now once you get all that junk burnt up, you can wash your hands here, and then it's just you coming in there because you got all your junk burnt up, but you can't carry that junk on your back and go into a restricted area of the holy place. Oh, turn to your neighbor and say, he's messing with my junk. <laughs> he's messing with my junk. Your junk needs to be burnt up. It needs to be burnt up. And one of the big problems that we do, because how many know this is all about the cross? All the stuff that I'm supposed to have crucified with Christ, I take that brazen altar, I tie it up, and the minute I hit it with a knife, it starts squealing. And I pick it up and say, oh, there, there. Well, maybe I need to reexamine what the Word of God has to say about it, and you'll, you'll justify yourself out of killing the thing that's supposed to be on the altar. When God's commandment is, don't take it off until it drops through the grate as ash. You see, the moment it drops through the grate as ash, it no longer has any power over you. You see, there was a day in my life, Mary and I had the occult coming after us, and they were actually pretty braggadocious about it. And they said, we're going to get you this Christmas. And we, being the good Baptocostals that we were, said, oh, yeah, that's our day. I tell you what, you got something coming. Just wait. The whole world's going to be worshiping Jesus. <laughs> Everything that we had broke down, even the new stuff, got sicker than a dog. And finally, Mary looked up and said, you know what? I think we better take a look at this. What a revelation. <laughs> we had to take all that stuff that was not of God. We had to take it. We had to put it right here on the brazen altar. We want the fire of God here in the, where the Ark of the Covenant is. You ain't going to get the fire there until you get some fire here. In fact, what's, what is really cool there's fire at the brazen altar. There's fire at the lampstand. And when you get the fire there and the fire there, you can finally get the fire here at the Ark of the Covenant. And there's a spirit about Christmas. How many can sense right now when you walk in? There is a spirit about Christmas. In fact, there's two different spirits. I remember when Mary and I were kind of wrestling with these things. Went down to Silver Dollar City, and they have Christmas, all you know, Christmas around the world, or whatever it's called. And there was a line drawn right down the middle of it, and they, and they, they had the, all the traditional, all the old yucky Christmas stuff, you know, and Father Christmas and all this, that, and the other. And over on the other side, they, they had stuff that was Christian-like to include little nails, nine-inch nails that you could hang from the cross with a red ribbon, you know, trying to, to make it more like Christ. And Mary and I walked in there, and we're, we're, we're just now, we're, the thing's starting to burn up on our altar. We're really examining it hard. We walk in there, and it, it's, it's like, okay, I feel one spirit here. I feel a, 
more of a pay, there's a religious spirit over here behind Christmas. There's a pagan spirit over here behind Christmas. And they were actually competing with each other to see whose attention you'd get. We walked away, and it was kind of like, boy, can't you feel that old worldly spirit of Christmas trying to attack the true spirit of Christmas? <laughs> we still had some wood burning right here that hadn't quite been really burned up yet. Finally, I did my own research. Quit disaccepting what everybody taught me in seminary. Did my own research, found out what the Christmas tree represented. Then after I put my jaw up, looked and found out what the wreath represented. Then put my jaw up, found out why we do a Yule log. It's all about the resurrection of Tammuz. Every bit of it is pagan. And if you go to any witch's site that has this stuff, they say, we can do all of this because it's our holiday. It's all about what we believe. That's why when we, were, when we had the occult coming after us down there, the, every one of them had a manger up. Every one of them were, were Christmas-aholics because it was one of their high holy seasons. And how many know Jesus wasn't born on December 25th? I'm saying that because we're kind of coming up into that season. But Apollos was. Tammuz was. Every pagan sun god was born on December 25th. Why? Because it's a type and shadow of the birth of Antichrist. How many know Jesus wasn't born on that day? Well, what day was he born on? Well, there's, there's some speculation even among the rabbis. Mary and I were talking about this because some of them believe when they kind of calculate everything out that he was born during Passover. Others calculate it out and believe he was born during tabernacles. Either way, it was a biblical pattern. <laughs> Isn't that right? So whether it's during Sukkot or Passover, it's a biblical pattern. More lean toward tabernacles, but either one's fine with me. The thing was, it wasn't in December. So we've had some things that we have had to burn on that altar. And as I was beginning studying this and praying about this, I, and the, the outer court is a huge court. And I, I saw Christians playing and doing all their things, but what they have absolutely abandoned is the brazen altar. I saw it with no fire, collecting dust and had cobwebs on it. And God said in the church today, it's one of the most abandoned elements of our worship toward God. There, there, are, there are hyper grace people that are even teaching today that you, once you get saved, you never have to ask for forgiveness of sin again. On what planet? What dimensional reality are you walking in because it's not mine? It may be cartoon land for all I know, but it's not this realm because there is, God take, when you understand the feast, they take us through cycles of sanctification. It teaches me how much I better make sure that the blood is over the doorposts of my life, that, I've come, that I have eaten all of the land, that I've received everything that Jesus did for me. The fall feast teach me I better prepare for the day of atonement because there's coming a time when he's coming back and he is going to have fire in his eyes. And let me tell you something. I, as a believer, better have fire in my eyes too when he comes back. Because that is what's going to signify who are his. Either their eyes are going to be full of fire or they're going to be full of black darkness. And I'm starting to see it on television when all these people get up and it's a bunch of talking heads, if you look past the Hollywood, you see black eyes. Their souls are full of darkness as they try to convince everybody, no, it's just this way. Oh, and Christians are falling for it. Why? Anything to keep me from the brazen altar. Anything to keep me from the brazen altar. When the brazen altar is the answer to deeper things of God. It's the answer to the deeper things of God, guys. And I, what I need to ask all of us this morning, number one, is Jesus Christ really the Lord and Savior of your life? Have you, are you being religious? You know, there are a lot of people who say, well, I'm saved. Why are you saved? Well, because I was raised in church. So was a church mouse. Doesn't make him a believer. 
I need to know that I know that I do. I have a real relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. Have I made him the Lord and Savior of my life? Second, have I made sure that his blood is over all the doorposts of my life? Let me tell you something. You know where the devil gets into your life? Where the blood ain't. I know that is incorrect grammar, but it is good theology. Where his blood isn't, the devil can come in. If there's an area of my life that I have a window or a door and I have not brought it under the lordship of Jesus and brought it under his blood, the enemy has an absolute right to go in there. But the moment the blood is over that thing, he has to stop. He cannot cross the bloodline. Then the second thing we need to, or third thing we need to ask ourselves, I'm losing count here. What is it that I need to bring right here? You see, I'm, I'm wanting the fire of God to fall in this place. I want the fire of God to fall in every one of your lives. It's not going to fall in the Ark of the Covenant until you get the fire down here first. There's some things in your life that God wants to burn up. But you don't understand what he's trying to do. Because along with some of the things the devil has convinced you you really need, they're also wrapped around with burden. They're wrapped around with pain. They're wrapped around with the sorrow the enemy has weaved into your life. And he's saying, this thing that I have weaved, this burden around, I, 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 I convince you that you need it to feel comfort. And when I take it and place it upon that altar, not only does my blankie get burnt up, but the pain, the depression, the anguish, the sorrow, the regrets. I've been preaching since I was 13, and I still have a lot of regrets. I was raised in the church, and guys, I've got a lot of regrets. And every once in a while, they come back to home. You, you come back, boy, boy, if I could just go back in time, I would, you know, I, I think like a sci-fi guy. Boy, if I could go back in time, I would change my timeline. I, I would alter time and space to be able to go back and just, if I could have done this right or said this right. And I, the guy says, quit doing that if you're so concentrated on the past, you can't build a future. And so I had to bring it out of the blood and I had to bring the regret of that and burn it on that altar and say, you know what? I've got to realize that that Mike Lake is dead. That Mike Lake's been crucified with Christ. And so I, I take the regret and even the, the, the fantasy comfort of, oh, oh, if I could just change that. And I take that and I burn it up on that altar. And I find out all of a sudden that regret leaves. It's no longer burdening me down. It's no longer making me second guess the things that I'm doing now based upon what I did back then. Because God changes my past. He brings it under the blood. He burns it up so that he can release his future in me. The devil keeps on telling us, no, 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 the past, the past, the past, the past. The Apostle Paul says, I press toward the mark, forgetting the things that are behind. Church, forget the things that are behind. Put them on the altar. Let God burn them up in his judgment, in his justice, in his compassion. Let the presence of God burn them up so that you can press toward who you really are. You have not even begun to experience the you that can be when God gets done with you. Ask a guy named Abram. Go in the Bible and ask him. Goes down to Egypt. This is my sister. Talking about his wife. This is my sister. Yeah, where's your other brother, Daryl? You know? <clears throat> Because he was afraid. He was not confident in who Almighty God had made him. He was letting the past determine his future. But as he grew with God, and God began to move him from Abram to Abraham, he found out several kings went and took his family when they took Sodom and Gomorrah. And this old man, by this time he's an old man, says, let's round up the boys. We're going to go open up a can of whoop, pagan. 
and we're going to go get our family back. Now, how many know that's a lot of different than, she's my sister? <laughs> God had changed him on the inside and gave him the confidence. Guys, but with God was with him. He could have went down there with a switch and whooped every one of them kings and took his family back with nothing but a switch and the power of God because he knew who God was in him. And so many areas of our life, because I won't take care of that brazen altar, I never discover who I can be in Christ. I'm always burdened by the past. Guys, it's time to get rid of the burden. It's time to let it go. It's the time for, the, for me to be crucified with Christ. And what I have found, guys, he requires me to do it on the installment plan. I gotta crucify a little bit of flesh every day. I gotta burn up some of my past every day because it's too much to do all at one time. It's too overwhelming. If God showed you right now everything that you need to take care of your, in your life to really be where you need to be with him, it would overwhelm you. Your brain would fry, and you'd be sitting over the corner going, buh, 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 So in his grace, he shows you just a little bit every day. Why? Because his grace is sufficient today to crucify and burn those things up because you can never give anything to God that he does not give you something in return. When you burn up the stuff of the world and of the flesh, it gives you the stuff of the kingdom. But you only have so much room that you can hold. You got to get rid of one to get the other. Well, Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, any area of our lives that is not under the blood, Father, we just ask that you would forgive Father, forgive, and we ask that the blood of Jesus would cover those things. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would just show us Jesus and show us what he needs to cover, that he would be our kinsman redeemer and that he would come and cover those things. Lord, our desire, our hearts, our hearts cry this morning is to be more like Jesus, is to move in the kingdom. But yet the devil's piled so many things on us. He has beguiled us so many times. For every one of those things, we repent this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we repent of them. Father, all the times that we did things that we should have known better to do, Father, we're sorry we repent of those things. And Father, we ask that you would give us your grace never, ever to do them again. Father, I believe that beginning today and throughout this week that the Holy Spirit is going to get more active in our lives than ever before. Holy Spirit, we invite you, roll up your sleeves, and Lord, go to work. Father, you're, the, the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would go to work right now in our lives, that he would take us on as a pet project. Because the enemy in times past took us on as a pet project and he loaded us down. And it's time to get the burdens off. It's time to get the things cleansed. It's time truly to become a Hebrew where we leave all those things aside and we cross on over into the things of God. And Father, I ask that you would show us day in and day out, that you would encourage us, that you would empower us to begin operating in our priesthood of keeping that brazen altar stoked full of the things of the enemy that needs to be burnt up. Father, we ask for your grace. We ask for your empowerment to get it done. And Father, right now through this whole week, Father, we, we ask that you would go before us in time and we ahead of time say, Satan, we bind up your power to get us off track but we will stay the course, we will fight the good fight of faith, and we will maintain what God is doing in our lives. And Father, we thank you, and we praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.